inbound for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions for Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope, and then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space, angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands, and the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, Park Hill. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Ah, fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildy? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, you could get drunk on it. Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle and celebrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done till we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martians? Sender, you're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's the kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We'll set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors, and from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife edged double shadows on the desert. All right, come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got to eat, Jackie? Soda, smothered in cold chicken fat. Good, I thought it was something I couldn't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Captain! Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain, Captain Wilder. Oh, yes, over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well? Most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over toward the... What about it? People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. What did they die of? You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? 
It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. You need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hoop it up. Hey, hey, hey. How about a case, eh? Hey? Oh, good Lord. They have to do that now. Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. A little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> Yahoo! Twenty bottles were opened and drunk. The voices got louder. The Earth laughs and shouts echoing across the empty Martian sands. Spender listened to the wind over his ears, cool and whispering. He felt the land getting cooler. The stars drew closer, very near. The air smelled clean and new. He looked at the cool ice of the white Martian buildings over there on the empty sea lands. <laughs> oh, what a woman! Oh. Hey, what do we do with these empty bottles? Same stupid, there's a two cents deposit. Ah. <laughs> Throw them away! Hey, wait, wait, how about that building? Two to one on a buck, I can heave one right through that window. You're up! All right, here goes. Hey! Oh, God! Hey, double or nothing on the next shot. Put that bottle down, Biggs. Who's there, Mr. Spender? Stop smashing those windows. What's the difference? The planet's ours now. I guess I can do anything with it I want. Drop that bottle or I'll knock your teeth out. Yeah? Hey, just watch me. I warned you. Big. Hey, what's going on here? Spender! Spender! I hit him. He's crazy, Captain. He just walked up and slugged me. All right, Biggs. Spender, you come with me. Now, suppose you explain. What was the idea of... The noise, the drunken brawl. Spender, the men are tired. This has been a long trip. And you have a different way of seeing things. No, I'm seeing things all right. I'm seeing how we'll ruin Mars. We'll rip it up and rip the skin off the way we've already ruined Earth. Is that why you hit Biggs? Yes. I couldn't stand the idea of them watching us make fools of ourselves. Them? The Martians. They're dead. They're all dead. But they know we're here. Doesn't an old thing always know when a new thing comes? We've come a long way to smash their windows and spit in their wine. Well, maybe you're right. But I'm still going to fine you $50 for that fight. Now, come on, Spender. Suck in your chin. We'll go back there and play happy. Now they moved out into the moonlight across the desert. They made their way into the dreaming, dead city. The light of the racing twin moons glinted on the barrel of a pistol the long blade of a machete, the round, gurgling shape of a raised bottle. The wind blew in from the dead sea bottom and brushed through the silvery wire filigree of the towers. Strange music drifted down to the double shadowed streets, a thin, haunted music that played as it had played through the uncounted years of time. Nobody moved. The moons held and froze them. The wind beat slowly around them. Biggs, I just want to make a little noise. What kind of a celebration is this, anyway? Come on. They built this city thousands of years ago. And now where are they? How do they die? Who cares? They're dead. That's good enough for me. Lord Byron. What? Lord Byron, a 19th century poet. He wrote a poem that fits this city. Might have been written by the last Martian poet. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. 
Though the heart be still as loving, though the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul outwears its breast. And the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the earthmen stood in the center of the city. It was a clear night. There was not a sound except the music of the wind. At their feet lay a tile court worked into the shapes of ancient animals and images. They stood there, silvered by the double moons beneath the crystal towers of Mars. And then Biggs was sick, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. And Spender turned and walked away into the city, alone in the moonlight, never once stopping to look back. It was a morning that might have been a Monday, or a Tuesday, or any day on Mars. Biggs was on the canal rim, his feet hung down in the cool water, soaking, while he took the sun in his face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Biggs? Didn't you go out with the search party? Yeah. I come back. I got a blister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? Look. Look, Cherokee. See that? Well, anyway, I had enough searching. Four days hunting for that screwball spender. Didn't find him yet, huh? Oh, uh, good riddance. Oh, my feet. I'm going to soak them in the canal. Uh, if I was wilder, I wouldn't worry about that nut spender. Let him go. He's a cracked pot anyway. Well, he's a little foggy upstairs, I guess. Hey, why don't you take your feet out of that canal, Biggs? I got to make coffee out of that water. Coffee? You call that stuff coffee? I had a motorcycle once that dripped grease that tasted better than... Hey, wait a minute, Biggs. Hey, hey, look over there. Where? By that bush. There's someone there. Hey. It's him. Hey. Hey, Spender. Spender? He's coming over. Why don't he stay lost, that crazy jerk? Hi, Spender. Long time no see. Hello, Cherokee. I have been exploring some ruins. Oh, you and them ruins. You're like a dog in a boneyard. What's the matter? Why don't you just say something? Where you been? Up in the hills. What would you say if I told you I found a Martian? Oh, yeah? Where? Never mind. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you were a Martian and people came to your land and started to tear it up? Well, I know how I'd feel. I've, I've got Cherokee blood in me. My grandfather told me a lot of things about the way they kicked the Indians around in the Oklahoma Territory. If there's any Martian around, I'm all for him. How about you, Biggs? They're dead. They're all dead. It's a good thing, too. Well, I found a Martian. Up in a dead town in the hills. I've been reading their books, and they're easy to understand. And I've learned their language. And then I found this Martian. And I brought him here, now. I don't see no Martian. I'm the last Martian... What did you say? Biggs, I'm going to kill you. Oh, cut it out. What kind of a lousy joke is that? And I don't... Now, don't put that gun away. <laughs> You're kidding, huh? Uh, Spender, you... <laughs> He's dead. You killed him. You can come with me, Cherokee. You're an Indian. You know how the Martians would feel. You can be with me in this. You killed him. You just... You just killed him. He deserved it. You're crazy. Maybe I am, but you can come with me. Come with you? For what? Go on, get out of here, you crazy murderer. Of all of them, I thought you'd understand. I thought you'd remember what happened to your own people. You get out of here, you crazy murdering... Don't reach for that gun. Spender. Spender. Hathaway, break out the arms locker. Issue pistols, rifles, and grenades. Yes, sir. And you'd better get the Bible out of the navigation chest. We have to bury these two. Now, Park, will you start digging a grave, hmm? How about Spender? We'll have to go up in the hills and find him. Just let me at him with my bare hands, a crazy murdering louse. That's enough, Park. Your man is sick. He must be... Sick my eye, he's... That's a... enough. Now grab a shovel and start digging. Spender. 
Spender saw the thin dust rising in the valley, and he knew the pursuit was beginning. The sun burned farther up the sky, and the blue sand drifted lazily across the sea bottom below. He sat beside a quiet pool 10,000 years old and held the silver book. Through the house played the strange wind music of ancient Mars. And he heard voices whisper in his mind. I hear you. I've always heard you. Even down there on Earth. No, I won't run. What's the use? Live, Earthman. Live, live, what for? To see them tear down your temples and put up hot dog stands? Run, 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 run. Ah, they've seen me now. They know I'm up here. It's wilder now. I've got them right in my sights. Kill, 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 kill. Funny, he hasn't ordered them to use grenades. They could lob one right up here and blow me to bits. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the captain thinks I'm too nice to be blown to bits. He wants my death to be clean. Just one bullet hole in me, nothing messy. And why? Because he understands me. Kill, 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 the only kill, one in the crew who ever did. Kill, 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 well, at kill, least kill, I can do the same for him. Kill, kill, Just one bullet in his head, a kill, nice kill, clean kill, death. Kill, kill, All I have to do is pull the kill, trigger kill, and then... It's no use. I can't do it to him. Spender! Spender! Can you hear me, Spender? I hear you, Captain. What do you want? Talk! Truth! All right. Come on up. Leave your gun down there and keep your hands up. Huh. That's quite a climb. You uh, mind if I sit down? Hmm. How long do you think you can hold out? Until you're all dead. Now, why didn't you kill all of us this morning when you had the chance? You could have. I know. I got sick. After I started killing people, I realized they were just fools and I shouldn't be killing them, but it was too late. So I came up here where I could get angry again. Why did you do it? When I was a kid, my folks took me to visit Mexico City. I'll always remember the way my father acted loud and big. And my mother didn't like the people because she thought they didn't wash enough. I can, I can see my mother and my father coming to Mars and acting the same way. Anything that's strange is no good to us. We aren't fit to take over this planet. But to kill two men. How would you feel if a Martian spit on the White House floor? You know, you haven't acted very civilized yourself. Today. I'll kill you all off, Wilder. That'll delay the next rocket five years, and then I'll kill them too. And if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 60. And I'll meet every expedition that lands on Mars. Oh, I'll be very friendly. I'll explain our rocket blew up one day. And then I'll kill them off. And I'll save Mars for half a century. And by then, maybe the Earth people will give up. And yet you're outnumbered. We already have you surrounded. In an hour, you would be dead. I found an underground passage that'll take me back in the hills, Wilder. I'll go back there. And then I'll pick you off one by one. We'll see. Well, it's a nice town you've got here, Spender. It's beautiful. I'd like to live here. You can. Join me. You're not like them. Why go back to them, Captain? I'll, I'll show you what a good life these people had. I'll be... Oh. No, there's too much earth blood in me. I may even agree with you about all this, but that does not change what I must do. You won't stay? No. This is your last chance, Bender. Look, you're sick. Now, come along with me quietly. No. no. One, one last thing. If you win, do me a favor. Try to see that they don't tear this planet apart. Right. And if it helps, just think of me as a very crazy fellow who went berserk one summer day. It'd be easier on you that way. Now I'll think that over. So long, Spender. Bye, Captain. Good luck. <laughs> 
The men spread out again, walking and then running on the hot hillside places where there would be sudden cool grottos that smelled of moss and sudden open blasting places that smelled of sun or stone. The men ran and ducked and ran and squatted in the shadows. I'll blow his brains! Captain Wilder hugged the rock warm by the sun. He gasped, for the air was thin and not meant for running. Spender lay at the top of the hill, and a gap in the rocks showed the white of his shirt against the shadows. Wilder looked at the towers of the little clean Martian village, like sharply carved chess pieces lying in the afternoon. He saw the rocks and the interval between where Spender's chest was revealed. Go on, Spender, get out. You only got a few seconds to escape. Go on, get out of the caves. Come back later. You go now. I've got to win this. I've got to think that I'm right. Pull this trigger. Go now. Get out. I'll get him. A slug in the head, I'll blow his bloody brain. No, Park Hill. Put down that gun. I'll do this myself. Oh, Spender. Why didn't you get out? Why? 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 They buried him in that ancient valley town where the music of the wind played on through the days and the nights. They laid him in an ancient silver sarcophagus with waxes and wines which were 10,000 years old, his hands folded on his chest. The last they saw of him was his peaceful face in the cold silver light of the racing twin moons. The captain found the poem in Spender's pocket, and he read it before he shut the marble door. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. The next afternoon, Parkhill did some target practice in one of the dead cities, shooting out the crystal windows and blowing the tops off the fragile towers. Captain Wilder caught Parkhill and nearly knocked his teeth out. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you the Ray Bradbury story and The Moon Be Still as Bright, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Clark Gordon, Dick Hamilton, Nelson Almstead, Lawrence Kerr, and Stan Early. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1.